Our gospel for this evening comes from Matthew. We are in the first chapter. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement secretly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken to the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he was unintimate with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. We started with one verse. Actually, it wasn't even a whole verse. It was just phrase. The first part of one verse. This last Wednesday night, our YC group got together, our junior high ministry, and we, because we were in Advent, we're gearing up for Jesus and Christmas and Nativity and all of that kind of stuff, I thought, why don't we talk a little bit about that? And so we used one verse. Well, only the phrase of one verse. We looked at verse 18 from Matthew, the first part. Bible scholars would call it verse 18a. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. That's it. That's all we read. And then I asked him one question. What are the assumptions that are built into this one phrase? So we thought about it for a minute or two. A couple of the answers came really quick. And other ones, we had to think about it and dwell on it. And because, you know, we all have assumptions. We have ideas that are written in. And sometimes it takes a moment to realize that some of our thoughts are so embedded that they, they are assumptions. So we thought about it, and some of the answers that we gave were, well, this assumes that we know who Jesus is. It assumes that we know what Christ means, because we know that Christ is not his last name on the birth certificate. It's actually his job title. It assumes that we know what it means for Jesus to be a Messiah, because, see, we know what Christ means. It assumes that we know why Jesus was born. And we didn't write this one down, but this one kind of floated in our entire conversation. We also assumed that this story matters. Because we come to this story. And Matthew, to be fair, Matthew's rendition of Jesus' birth is a little, it's a little dry. It's kind of lacking on the details. And it's not fair to him because Luke gets the big night. Though to be fair to Luke... Luke puts more details into his story. Luke's a little bit more of a, of a fancy storyteller because we have Mary, we have Joseph, we have the big, long trip, and in our minds it takes all these days, it's the middle of the night, and there's a sandstorm, and we try to hype it up just a little bit because that's what we do in our minds. And they get to the Holiday Inn in Bethlehem, and it's already closed, so now they've got to find some barn somewhere to have a kid. And then the kid is put into a manger. And then out in the fields, there's these shepherds who are watching their flocks by night. And then come the fireworks and the horns and the trumpets and, of course, the harps. Then the angels are making all of this noise, this huge clamor, just so the shepherds can know that Jesus is born. That's our Christmas Eve story. Matthew's version, not quite so fun, not quite as interesting, but it also has a lot of assumptions built into it. Because Matthew just kind of goes. Matthew wrote this gospel, let's say 80, 90 CE. Jesus died on the cross and was risen on the third day, let's say 37 CE. That's kind of what scholars are going with right now with dates. Matthew wrote this two generations after Jesus has come and gone and ascended into heaven. That means we already have, when Matthew is penning these words, two generations worth of the story of Jesus. We already have two generations worth of understanding of who Jesus is. Here we are, 2,000 years later, and we have this accumulated wealth of knowledge and ideas and theologies and ideologies and concepts of who Jesus is. So we hear that one phrase, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. 
And it can speak so much. And at the same time, because we know the story, and some of us may know this story really well, it's also really easy that as soon as I read that first line, we're already zoned out. Because we know Jesus was born, Mary, Joseph, the angels. At some point, some camels and some Middle Eastern men show up. And then we have them as well, but they're not. Matthew, by the way, gives us that story. But we have all these elements, and we kind of pack them all in. And as soon as we hear that this is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place, we start to fill in all the gaps. And if, you know, in our relationship with God, we know that as much as we know a lot about God, and we know a lot about Jesus, we also don't know a whole lot, but we have a lot of assumptions. And one of the tricks, one of the difficulties, one of the traps, and I wonder if Matthew was facing this as well, is that when we know Jesus so well, we can, we can begin to disconnect ourselves from the story. We can begin to hear this about a story about a, a kid who was born 2,000 years ago who did all these really great things and then fast forward and we know that he dies on a cross and resurrected on the third day, does a few more really cool things and he's ascended into heaven and the disciples take over and now we have our faith. And sometimes when we think of Jesus in those mechanical terms and those assumptive terms and those ideologies, theologies and concepts that we carry with us, it's hard to imagine that this story is actually about us, or that maybe it has anything at all to do with us. And, Mar and Matthew kind of dives right in. Again, he's kind of dry, a little boring, doesn't have a whole lot of details, probably could have added a couple things just to make it a little more interesting. But he just jumps right in, because his congregation, when he wrote this, already knew the story. Just like you and I know the story. There's, there's a woman named Mary. She doesn't get much of a part in this particular version. And then there's Joseph who gets engaged by an angel who has no name. And then this angel and Joseph talk because Joseph wants to get out of the marriage, so he's trying to secretly end it. Doesn't want to embarrass people, but you know, he kind of wants to be done. The angel comes and talks to, talks to Joseph. And all the way, all along, as we're going with this, yep, we know this story, yep, this all sounds familiar. We've heard these details before, this all makes sense. We know how it plays out in the end. Joseph goes back to Mary, happily ever after. And in the midst of this story that we know so well, Matthew sneaks in a bit of a hook. He goes back. And he goes back to Isaiah. And if you want to look it up, it's Isaiah chapter 7. But he goes back to Isaiah, one of the prophets. Prophets proclaim the word of God, which means this is God's words that's been proclaimed long before Matthew, or, well, long before Matthew, but long before Mary and Joseph even existed. And this is the word of God, which means it extends all the way back since the very beginning of creation. This is a promise that God has made ever since existence. Verse 23. Look, a young woman will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. We kind of know what Emmanuel means. We've seen the banners. We've sung the songs. There's three or four churches just within driving distance of here that are, have that same name. We know what this means. But in a way, Matthew is trying to catch us, trying to grab our attention and help us to imagine that maybe this story about this kid who was born 2,000 years ago to a mom and a dad who weren't even sure that they liked each other anymore, that this kid and this story is about us, that somehow it's for us because it's written into the name. God with us. Matthew is trying to help us to see that Jesus is being born into the world to become us. And actually, you know what? Let's even take Jesus out of the story. He's not born yet. We're kind of rushing that anyway. Let's take Jesus out of this. Let's boil this down and distill this a little bit more and hear this for the words that they are meant to be for us. God is with us. And in fact, let's boil it down even more. Let's get it even closer to home. And let's just say it like this. God is with you. And God is breaking into the world to become you. Not a better version of you. Not the idealized form of you. Not the wealthier, healthier, taller, shorter, better off part of you. Not the part of you that doesn't have addictions, doesn't have foils, doesn't have brokenness and shame. God is breaking into the world to become you. As you are, right now, 
wearing your flesh, your blood, your pain, your joy, your excitement, your celebration, your disappointment, your frustrations. God is coming into the world to become you. You. God's coming into this world with all of your skeletons that you've hidden in the closet. And some of them maybe we just put out in the front lawn so everybody can see them. God is coming into the world to become you with all that pile of trash and debris that we've created from all the burned bridges and all the broken relationships and all the things that we do because we're human and that's what we do. The path we have carved through creation. But God is coming to be you. Not like you. Not some version of you. God is coming to be you. God is coming into the world to become you, and God is coming into the world to become your neighbor. God is coming into the world to become the person who's sitting near you in the pew. God is coming into the world to become that person on TV who you despise, or you didn't vote for, or maybe you voted for and now you regret. God's coming into the world to become a high schooler who feels cast out. God is coming into the world to be our classmate. God is coming into the world to become an LGBTQ non-binary adult. God is coming into the world to be a brown-skinned Middle Eastern man with curly hair and a black beard. God is coming into this world to be God's people. And yeah, we have a whole lot of assumptions. We have a whole lot of predictability. And we have a whole lot of disbelief that this story could actually be about us. So God is trying to speak through this old story and all these old bits of knowledge and all of these ideologies and theologies and concepts that we carry. God is trying to break through that to help us to realize that, yes, this is a story about Jesus and this is a story about us. This is a story about God's promise that has existed since creation began. That God has promised to be part of our lives, to be part of this world, to be part of us. God is revealing through Jesus that God does not function outside of humanity. God does not exist beyond your reality. God is not separate from us. God is not distant from us. God is woven into your lived experience. God is part of the fabric and your flesh. And God is here. God is with us. God is claiming us. God is loving us. God is shaping us. God is forgiving us of all of that debris behind us. God is breathing life into us with every breath that we take. God is breaking through every assumption, every prediction, everything we carry. And across all of the distance that we feel, simply to be with us. To be you. To be in our lives. So yeah, this is a story about a kid who was born to a mom and a dad 2,000 years ago. And someday that kid is going to do some really amazing things. And God is going to bring forth life through this kid. Who is God? And this kid will one day become a man and tell us these words about healing and forgiveness and, and bread and about water and about hope and about life and about forgiveness and about grace that is poured over our lives without anything that we have done, all because God loves us. And at the same time, this story is about us. It's about God loving us. God caring for us, caring for you so much that God will become you to fulfill this promise that began at the very beginning of creation and continues to pass on generation after generation. God is here. God is with us, within us, and part of us. God proclaims this old, old promise even tonight so that we can hear again that we are not alone, that we are not on our own, that we are worthy of love and that God's kingdom may not be dependent on us and yet is for us and for our neighbors so we can know love and we can know God's mercy. Amen.